Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Muss. I'll be moderating this uh, retail panel. Um, we're only talking about retail and only Brooklyn. Uh, I'd like to introduce the panel. Uh, starting from my right, Jeff Zalznik, managing partner of Major Food, a major restaurant operator in New York City uh, who has very big plans for Brooklyn that we'll hear more about. Uh, Al LeBose, principal of United American Land. Al, besides being a great friend of ours, of, of uh, my family's over the last uh, 20, 30 years, is one of the true pioneers of, of retail, not just in Brooklyn, but if I'm allowed to mention the word Manhattan, uh, Ofer, is that okay? Okay, the word Manhattan, Al, is uh, not just in Brooklyn, but a major pioneer of retail in Manhattan as well. Uh, and he's done some things in downtown Brooklyn that have made all of us here a lot of money. We should really thank him. Uh, the next uh, person to Al's right uh, is uh, Ben Bernstein, uh, principal of Red Sky Capital. Uh, ben is one of the largest retail landlords in Williamsburg, if not the largest retail landlord in Brooklyn, in, uh, in uh, Williamsburg. So all those cool shops you guys enjoy shopping, upon, shopping on and going to on the weekend, uh, a lot of the thanks for that goes to Ben. So Ben, thank you for being here. Uh, we look forward to hearing much more about what's happening next in Williamsburg. And finally, an old friend of mine, Chris Conlin, uh, Executive VP and COO, it's a lot of titles, uh, at Acadia. Um, <laughs> many of you might know Chris from, from uh, RIPCO. Uh, Chris has had a really long and storied career in the retail world in New York. And uh, one of the people who really, as part of RIPCO, pioneered the idea of big box uh, users coming into New York, uh, many of which were not in New York. And I think that's what has led, part of, partly what's led to other retailers finding New York. You know, it wasn't that long ago that retail uh, in New York was a completely different world from the rest of the country in terms of users. A lot of people didn't want to come here for whatever reason. So Chris was one of the people who helped pioneer that uh, movement from, um, from other parts of the country to the United States, to, uh, to New York, excuse me. So why don't we start with Jeff. Jeff, you're the only non-landlord on this panel. I hope you don't feel too out of place. Um, and I know you and uh, Ben have a great relationship from uh, business-wise. You're, you're, you're going to be, or if you're not already, a, a tenant of his. Uh, but you're, you have a lot of holdings in Manhattan, I'm going to mention again. Uh, and you're going into Brooklyn in a big way, as you described to me the other day. Why don't you describe to the, to the audience a little bit of what your mindset is when you decide to jump from Manhattan to Brooklyn? Um, I mean, I think for us, it's, a, it's kind of the natural next step with all the exciting things that are happening in Brooklyn. Um, you know, for us, it's looking at which restaurants and what products we have that would make sense here and that makes sense in different neighborhoods. One of our restaurants, which is uh, called Parm, which is kind of our casual Italian-American sandwich shop. Uh, we currently have one in Nolita. Um, and it really just fits perfectly with the neighborhoods here, uh, both in Williamsburg and uh, here on Flatbush. So we are actually right now, you know, already signed and in, in process to be opening a Parm in Williamsburg in one of Ben's buildings, which we're very excited about and uh, one right here on Flatbush, right by the Barclay Center uh, in one of the Pinchix buildings, and uh, we're excited about that as well. So we felt those were both great locations for Parm. Um, I think that the demand is there. We love the neighborhoods. You know, we generally, we generally like to go to places that we actually like being at um, because uh, we tend to spend a lot of time in our restaurants. So, you know, I think that as the neighborhoods have progressed, it, it you know, made a lot of sense and was a great fit for us. And we were able to find landlords like Ben and like uh, the Pinchicks who are great to work with and that we felt comfortable kind of bringing, uh, bringing our act over the bridge. So we're, uh, that was kind of the inspiration. And Ben, uh, by the same token, you, had, you have to select your tenants. I'm sure you have plenty of people looking to rent your space, especially in Williamsburg. What was it that attracted you to Jeff? And could you give us an, uh, an insight I'll into- i the fact that he's a <coughs> Cornelian. Um, a fellow Cornelian, okay. um, I, I, I loved uh, I love the I love the product. Um, we we've been a we we play in a few in very few sandboxes, and so given that we really heavily invest in our communities and we're trying to really ma uh, accumulate a lot of size, um, one of the things that we really focus on is uh, 
this is not really moving because it's taped, that's why, um, is curating our retail and making sure that the tenants that we put in place really fit for the vibe and, and really produce and perform uh, in, the, in the long run. We, are, we, we consider our tenants partners in our property and in the future of the development of the communities. These are communities that are really in, a, in, a, in the middle of a renaissance and it's sensitive. So what percentage of the property are you giving Jeff? Uh, oh, Jeff has 4,000 <laughs> square feet, and that's and that's what he's got. Okay, got it. For a limited time, though. Uh, long lease. Okay. Long lease. We're excited. We think. Uh, I mean, I had my 30th birthday at Parm, so I'm a I'm a I'm a fan. Okay. I'm not only a you that's know good. it's like the it's like the hair club for men. I'm not only a client. I'm. <laughs> Is it like it really like it or just you're just using that as an as an analogy? I'm like it, really <laughs> like it. Uh, I'm concerned about my, you know, my waist, but you know, that's why we have a we have a salad bar coming next to, so I can do, you know, I can do one, uh, one one day, you know, salad salad the next day. Okay, good. Uh, Chris, you guys, uh, you, I, I should say, Acadia uh, was really a pioneer with City Point, and you stayed with it through some pretty tough times. Uh, can you give us some insight into what you guys were thinking at the height of the recession and why your company decided to continue to put the financial resources into that project and now uh, how uh, obviously it's turning out well, but just give us a little bit of a, of a road as to what, what the road was for you guys and, and what happened there? I'd love to tell you it's turning out exactly how we planned. Uh, but when we bought the property in 2005 from Thor, uh, we were to be the commercial uh, partner of a, a mixed-use development that was headed by CalPERS. Uh, in 2009, uh, CalPERS uh, defaulted on their obligation uh, to fund certain parts of the project, so we elected to buy them out. And we bought them out uh, for $22 a foot. Um, they left about $100 million behind. That's bad news for them. Good news for us, we had a new basis in the property. And we elected to go forward ourselves rather than rely on a partner who uh, who was defaulting and run the risk of that again. So for a company like ours that um, was at the time more of a suburban shopping center REIT, we are now much more urban and street focused and we'll talk about that in a little while, but uh, it was a big undertaking for us. And uh, we partnered with Paul Travis from Washington Square Partners and he's the development executive and Paul and I have seen it through its uh, redesign and its construction and we've structured deals. Uh, we decided to de-risk the, prop the project as much as, as much as we could. So prior to breaking ground, we had sold off the two residential towers, one to BFC for the affordable housing piece, and one to the Brodsky family for the market rate piece. And then we leased all the upper floors before we broke ground to City Target, Century 21, and Alamo Draft House. So before we actually put a shovel in the ground, those pieces were put together. Uh, we'll announce in the next 30 days the sale of our residential uh, uh, component, which is 18,000 feet of land on the north end of the property at Willoughby Street. Uh, that has 600,000 square feet of residential FAR. Uh, we had 19 bidders. We narrowed it down to four. We've selected one, and we'll make that announcement in the next 30 days. That's exciting. That'll be the, the end of my day risking experience, and I look forward to just leasing the ground floor in the lower level as we continue to finish up the steel work. The facade goes on this summer. We deliver to Century 21 in January, and we'll make some new announcements about leasing probably in the next uh, 60 to 90 days. Well, I have to say the word de-risking is music to my ears as a developer. We love that, but it's not always possible. So Al, uh, that brings me to you. <clears throat> uh, a lot of things you do are actually risking uh, and in a big way, especially I, I would just point out one particular deal, the municipal uh, retail you purchased from the city, where you had a lot of use restrictions on the space that you were able to, I guess you were, you were willing to risk the fact that that use restriction wouldn't, wouldn't hurt you too much and you were able to still turn it all to your advantage. Maybe you can give us a little insight into that deal. So um, we, the municipal building was about 45, 50,000 square feet on the first and second floor, as well as the basement on the corner of Court and Dural 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 Street. So we bought it from the EDC. And EDC says, you know, we, we, we have to make certain commitments. I said, okay, we'll do it. But I, I, want, I want the piece, okay? So they said, well, you can't put a, a cell phone store. I said, okay, we won't do that. Can't put a bank can't put a, uh, 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 a, a pharmacy, and you can't put fast food. And not only that, yeah. you have to have new retail, because you promise you're gonna bring in new retail. Has to be within a mile and a quarter uh, uh, radius from that location. There has to be a, um, uh, a retailer that's not there within that mile and a quarter radius. So of course, after I close, who calls me? Dwayne Reed, 
uh, 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 Citibank, Bank of America. I could have got that thing rented 20 times over. But, but you know, I felt it was really great, a phenomenal, phenomenal location. And, and, you know, being a Brooklyn guy and knowing the location, I said, you know, this is like a no-brainer. So, so, so the biggest challenge was now trying to convince retailers that know about Manhattan, know, you know, they hear about Brooklyn, that this little dead zone that's been dead since it was been built in 1926, there's absolutely no activity that there's going to be retail there. And it's, it's going to be great. So the first guy I had was Sephora. Sephora, who, who's a tenant now, they killed me. They negotiated a deal for 15 months. The deal died four times. They just did not believe in the location. I said, it's like a no-brainer. So, um, so they tell me this. They said, listen, Al, you promised to bring great retail. I said, yeah. So we're going to have to, we're asking you to do a, a co-tenancy clause. I said, well, what does that mean? So until you fill up 100% or 80%, I forgot the time, the, the, the percentage, with the co-tenants, we're going to be paying percentage rent. I said, Ugh. I never did that before. I said, I'm thinking, okay, but you know something? I have all eyes on me at the city of EDC. I have to look like a hero with them. I said, okay, let, I'll make the deal. So I put them in. They open up November. By the way, the, nobody's there. So in other words, 100 feet away, 200 feet. They're, they're the only, only tenant there. They're doing phenomenal. Call me up, open up November, December, January. I said, okay, where's my percentage rent? So in other words, so they're going to be paying me percentage rent until the co-tenancies are opened up. All right, so we asked, called them up and said, okay, where, where's my, well, I want to know what your sales are. And so the percentage rent, they said, oh, no, we're not paying you your percentage rent. I said, why? We're doing so much business <laughs> that we're going to be paying you base rent. I said, okay, you, know, you just proved my point. And now with that, now the word gets out because all the retailers speak to each other. So now Neiman Marcus has c came along and signed, you know, it's sugar, best location out of 28 stores, the best location in the entire chain, smallest footprint. So that's great. A lot of power are these restrictions in perpetuity that you have? Uh, I'm are sorry? these restrictions on your space in perpetuity, or is, is there a shelf life on it? There is once you have, the, no, there were initial, it was what's they call the initial uh, lease up. Once you finish with the initial lease up, then you have, you know, I don't know, like 60% or 70%. Right. But at this point, I'm very, you know, they're doing the business, so we're good. It doesn't matter, you're leased up. By the way, I, I want to say that if anybody yeah. wants to, call out a question or, or raise your hand in the middle, no problem. We, we'd love to hear your questions at any time. It doesn't, doesn't have to wait till the end. Um, but let me go back to Ben for a second. Uh, you're, you know, you've been in Williamsburg for quite a while with the retail, I would imagine. So my question to you is, how much, how much more does this have to go? Like, how much longer does, do you think this cycle is going to go the way it is in Williamsburg? Uh, not just retail, but residential. Do you think that there, do you think that we've hit a certain point, or do you think it's just going to continue uh, for a number of years to come? And I guess, because you have a unique perspective, you know how your tenants are doing, and you have a lot of tenants, and they're spread all throughout the neighborhood. So you probably know almost better than anybody what's going to happen in Williamsburg in the next few years. So I guess this is a good opportunity to find uh, out. I don't know if, I, if I'd say that. I actually definitely wouldn't say that. But um, that's, that's why I'm here. I'm uh, saying it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I think Williamsburg's a, a really interesting community. Um, I think it's in it's in uh, a really unique stage in its evolution. Um, I think you're, we've seen a lot of sort of straw condo developments in the early stages just thrown up and you're seeing a, a lot of, uh, and you saw a lot of rental development that's really sustainable and, and bringing high quality residents here for a long time uh, into Williamsburg and, and Northern Brooklyn uh, in perpetuity. Um, our, 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 uh, our tenants are doing really well. Um, Urban Outfitter uh, opened Space 98 on 98 North 6th Street, which is the second time they've done this sort of specialty concept. They have one in LA, West Hollywood, and one here, um, and, it's, and it's really just killing it. Um, their restaurant opens on May 9th. Everyone should try it out. Um, that would be tomorrow. <laughs> Bar is open, though, right now. Um, uh, it's it's doing really well. Their sales are insane. They they did a, a joint venture with Adidas to do uh, sort of hip, cool, high design sneakers in the basement. Uh, it's it's really a fun spot. Um, we're talking to tenants that you know six months ago was weren't interested in Brooklyn, and and the tenants that and 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 you know 24 months ago would have laughed me out of the room. 
Uh, so it's it, it's a pretty exciting time. Now you can laugh them out of the room when they make their offer to you. Uh, uh, we, yes, exactly. It's nice, um, but it's uh, we're in a good place. We think uh, Williamsburg is really developing. We think the condo market is going to. I mean, the guys before me could talk more about that, but the condo market's really picking up. Um, we're, we're really excited for the next couple stages. Okay, I'm going to ask you guys in rapid fire to name a neighborhood that you think is the next place for retail to develop in Brooklyn. We'll go one by one with Chris. Give me a neighbor, just one word. <laughs> it's gonna sound foolish, but it's downtown Brooklyn. Downtown Brooklyn's got a long, long way to go. Okay, Ben? Um, I think that's. I think it's got a long run. No, it's gotta be something but, different than okay, what Chris Okay, Greenpoint. Says. I'm a, oh. Greenpoint, Greenpoint. Greenpoint. <laughs> Al, can't be where you own property already. How's that? Fort Green. Okay. <coughs> Jeff? Um, I was going to go with Greenpoint also, but... Uh, All right, we'll let you get away with it because you're yeah, coming from Manhattan, yeah, so you're I'm still learning the neighborhoods a little bit. <laughs> um, but, Jeff, uh, you mentioned to me the other day that you're creating a commissary uh, in Brooklyn, yeah. which is going to serve your Manhattan and Brooklyn restaurants. Yeah. That's an interesting concept. Why, why put the commissary in Brooklyn? Is it, be is it because you're getting a little bit of a lower rate on the, on the, on the real estate, or is it a convenience factor? What, what is it about that? You know, uh, almost... Everything we do often has to do with the specific opportunity, but um, for us, it makes a lot of sense for a variety of reasons. We're, we're going to put a commissary in uh, the new industry city development. Um, it's very good for us in terms of, you know, I was originally looking in Long Island City, and just because that's where you're supposed to go look for commissary space, so I went to Long Island City. And uh, actually, for our particular locations, it ended up being that Brooklyn was a uh, much more central, especially being that two of the locations that will be serving are in Brooklyn, and uh, the other locations are in downtown Manhattan. So it was actually much more convenient for us in terms of travel and in terms of the space and for what we needed, you know, they were able to get us exactly what we needed and we had, the, you know, the right relationship uh, with them to work it out so that we could get the type of space, when we needed it, how we needed it, to our exact specifications, so that it ended up being better to do it there than to do it in a standalone kind of warehouse building, which I was about to do it in in Long Island City. And another big motivator there was also that there's upside for me because you know if if everything happens in Industry City that uh, is you know slated to happen, or even if half of it happens, there's upside that I can actually do retail business there. So not only can I do retail business, direct the businesses that are going to be filling up that kind of creative office space that they're looking to put there, I can also you know, add retail windows, I could add something in their food hall, and it also provides for the commissary to have some, a sales element as well, which is great. So for me, that made a lot of sense, and I mean, I think that... Um, you know, it's exciting, and you know, just like you know, the lease we have in Williamsburg, and just like uh, the lease that we did in Flatbush, it has a lot to do with you know the people that are behind it. I mean, I'm a big believer in working with people who have a vision for you know what things are going to be. You know, Ben has a very specific vision of how he's developing his property, and that's very much in line with the style. Um, and kind of level of quality that we look for. Same thing with uh, the pin chicks who we're doing, you know, on Flatbush. You know, we know that we're not going to get certain types of tenants next to us, which is very important to our brand because in both locations, you know, we one of the first people kind of of our nature coming into those markets. And uh, similarly with Industry City, you know, we, we know their track record, you know, from Chelsea Market and the same guys that are working on that. And I think they're going to create something great there. So it was, it, it was one of the things that brought us there. So on, a, on all those levels, it made a lot of sense for us. That is a great answer. I got to hand it to you. <laughs> and I, you gave us a lot more information than I would have expected. And I think it's great because it shows how synergistic uh, the, you know, when you think about what you're doing in Brooklyn, it's leading to other things happening in Brooklyn. Because you're here anyway, for the, for the restaurants, you put a commissary in. And I think that's the kind of thing that Industry City could serve. Um, my next question would be more towards Al, Ben, and Chris. Uh, and it, it relates to a common issue with retail that I've come across. And that is, when you want to develop retail, it's often very difficult because uh, the FAR is higher than just the retail square footage that makes sense. You're not going to build several floors of retail. So as a retail developer, and especially you, Chris, you guys are retail REIT, 
and I see that you you, know, you, were, you were able to make very creative use of the air rights, using them to, to down to take the odds of you know of a problem off the table by selling them ahead of time. Uh, but I guess that applies to all you all the developers on the panel. What do you do uh, when you want to create retail, and it's and it's just you just can't find it because the uses around the retail are so darn expensive, uh, and it might not be in your business plan to do that. Um, maybe you can give me a little idea. Of well, for us, it would it, it, if we were to invest in another project similar to City Point. So you're talking about a mixed-use development where yeah. we'd have to bear the responsibility of the upper floors as well as the commercial base. We would de-risk that again by partnering with one of the very highly, highly qualified uh, uh, Brooklyn-based uh, residential developers or or an office developer. We d that that risk doesn't scare us. We just know what we know, and we know we sure know what we don't know. We don't know how to build condos or apartments, and we don't like the office business, although it's a great business for some. Um, so we would we would look to partner up and, and pre-sell that up front, okay. and then just know do what we do best, which is retail at the base, and that would be defined as. Uh, one to four floors. Four is a question mark, but certainly one to three, possibly one to four. What about you, Ben? Is there, are there uh, other I'm uses? I'm a class agnostic. Um, I go where I see returns. It's just, I, I, we have a, we did some deals and we did some retail deals and um, throughout the, you know, from 2006 on and we just kept seeing better deals. That was where we saw opportunity. Um, our investors like us to Go for uh, swing for the swing for the fences, but not to miss. And some and we've seen that in retail to date. Uh, what a coincidence! Our investors also <laughs> want us to swing for the fences. <laughs> Thirty percent of our portfolios, uh, resi. Right. Forty percent is land. Um, that's so we we're all over the place. Okay. Just in Brooklyn. Right. Only Brooklyn. Remember everybody. Al, what about you? So, uh, we happen to like the mix. We like retail and residential together. You know, it's a good diversification. And, and we, we do them both. Uh, it all depends on really scale when you talk about you know, risk or what have you, you know, how big you are. The smaller the building is, of course, the, you know, the bigger the challenge is you know, getting egresses and cores and what have you, and that takes away from your retail. Right. So yeah, that, that's always a balancing act between, you know, okay, how much are we looking at retail? How much is, what's driving the project here? Is it the retail or the residential? And, and then from that, we, we, we go ahead and, and, and do the development. Okay. Um, at this point, I want you each to tell me a future project. You don't have to name the project, but if you could perhaps give us an idea into a project that you're working on without giving too much away, that would cause another person in the audience to grab your project from you. Uh, perhaps you could just give us an idea of the next thing you're working on in Brooklyn. Uh, something that would, that would not, again, not give too much away. Chris. So we're a a multi-state public company who invests equally in Chicago and Miami and Washington, D.C. and Boston and certainly New York. Uh, I can't tell you that we're currently working on a new project in Brooklyn. I will tell you that we're anxious to do more in Brooklyn, so I don't have any secrets to divulge. Okay. Um, I will tell you that it's very unlikely that we'll do another City Point project of that scale. Um, the, the, the human capital applied to that project um, has taken away from other opportunities elsewhere that the company has seen. So while we're very proud of that development, we think the learning experience will benefit us in, in countless ways. I don't think you're going to see us doing that. I think those projects are more suited to perhaps related Vornado um, and others. I don't think that that's for us. But, but like our investment um, on Nostrand Avenue, where we just finished a facade renovation and we're leasing up the ground floor and second floor office, um, you'll see us do a lot more of those opportunistic investments where we can come in and either slide into the capital stack at an appropriate and advantageous level or where we can come in and apply our leasing skills or our redevelopment skills and add value. That's what you'll see us doing in Brooklyn. Ben? Well, I own a full city block on the waterfront in Greenpoint, uh, and we're, uh, we've, we're, we're working with EDC and, um, and the city to finalize plans. Um, got about 652,000 square feet of buildable. Um, so, guess the secret's out. I yeah, well, <laughs> go online. It was there already. Um, okay. But uh, we, we, we that's why we're really bullish on Greenpoint. We think we think the waterfront in Greenpoint is an extension of the waterfront in Williamsburg, and we think the Esplanade from uh, from Domino all the way up to uh, Newtown is going to be really a really cool park development. Are you integrating retail into that development? Yes, we have about uh, we have about 100,000 square feet of uh, retail. Great. 
So, um, on, first of all, I, I like to say I'm working on multiple deals, but there's nothing to buy. I mean, the, the things are really adequate, you know, beyond, beyond. Uh, in Brooklyn, yes, I have other projects elsewhere, 150,000 square feet in Jamaica Avenue, but that's, we're talking about Brooklyn. I would Only say, Brooklyn. Okay. I would say um, on Fulton Street, where we have H&M, Nordstrom's Rack, and, uh, and TJ Maxx, um, that's a 275,000 square foot development. We have, we did it in two phases. First is the retail phase, which we're almost done. And then we had the residential phase from this gorgeous landmark building that we're gonna build 130,000 square feet of resi rentals, lofts, Manhattan style lofts. And you know, add on an add on of like 15,000 square feet uh, above. And, and that's what we're gonna, that's our second project. Okay. Uh, brokers. We all love them. They're a very important part of the business. Um, but I know, Al, you handle the leasing in-house, I believe, for a lot of your projects. Is that correct? Mostly. But it, it how, how does it work in that, you know, you guys are doing Brooklyn retail. Um, do you generally talk to brokers before you do your deals to get a sense, and then you bring them in as needed? How, how does that all work with some of these, so, uh, so some a of these deals? A lot of it's site-specific. Spe but it just always happens to be when I when I hire a broker, you know, to be exclusively representing me, we always end up making the deal through my my relationships and my connections. And the broker gets a commission, which is fine. Um, but we listen. You always have to end up by a broker, either which way. In other words, you know, most of the brokers are represented by by uh, most of the tenants are represented by brokers. And so the brokers have the part of the equation as to, and since I have very good relationships <coughs> across the board, before we go ahead and, and, and buy a deal, or, or as part of our due diligence, we call our friends and say, okay, what do you think about this neighborhood? This, if it's a broker I trust, I can even give them the location. Because chances are, if I'm working on it, these brokers know about it because other people have called them on it. And if you have people that you trust, and that's a big if, and, and you have a good relationship, then you'll have some good intel. They know not to cross the LeBose family, right? They know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Jeff and Ben, was, were, your, were your deals direct, or was there a, a broker uh, involved when you guys made your deals? Uh, ours, ours were direct. Yes. I mean, I, I haven't actually You met, you met at Cornell, is that how? I haven't, we met through, you know, we have a lot of people in common, and, um, you know, to be honest, you know, I haven't used a broker on any of my deals in Brooklyn, and I try not to use brokers. How do you do that? You ever. just you call you go yourself. You um, do the the uh, we're gonna have to escort you out of here uh, with, a, with a police yeah. escort. <laughs> um, you know, the truth is, I do work with a lot of brokers, but one thing is that I won't work with anyone exclusively because that's been a big problem for us in the past. Um, for restaurants, you know, I think you know, um, to his point, you know. Almost all of my deals are done based on relationships, and that's how almost every single one of my deals has been done. I mean, where um, I think that we've used a broker. I mean, we'll have, you know, in a year from now, we'll have about eight or nine restaurants open in New York, and we've had a broker on one of those deals. Um, and that's just because, just as I said before, a lot of how we come to things and the people that we feel comfortable working with as landlords, et cetera, come through relationships. And, and, and often I find that, you know, that extra step of, uh, you know, it, it often gets in the way and we prefer to kind of find things that happen organically. So I generally have a personal relationship with all of my landlords currently. And, uh, you know, in the case that we have or, or do use brokers, it's when we, you know, e even in that case, you know, I, I'm always working with brokers. I end up usually finding the thing I'm looking for, you know, just by chance, by meeting someone or through a relationship or someone that, you know, common friends or whatever it might end up being or someone that eats in our restaurant, you know, and uh, that's kind of always worked for us. Chris, well. Chris, bail out the brokers here. Come yeah. on. I, I'm happy to do so. <laughs> uh, bear in mind that I spent the first uh, 17 years of my professional career as a, as a real estate broker and founded Ripco with Peter and Todd and... 1992, sold my interest in 2007. So the brokerage business was very good to me. Um, but, but to Al's point, there, there is a, uh, there, there's, I, I feel in the brokerage community, um, there's haves and have nots, or those that whom, with whom we can have a trustworthy relationship, and then there are others. 
I'm sure this room is filled with trustworthy relationships for, for Acadia and for you, but um, the brokerage community is the lifeblood to, and the success, uh, the, the formula for success for our acquisition team. Without strong relationships with brokers that can teach us about the markets, that can keep us informed about sales and rent comps, and that can tell us where trends are emerging, we can't do it. We are a, uh, we at times can be a cumbersome public company who isn't as agile and as nimble and as well informed as the brokerage community. So without them, we're out of business. When it comes to leasing our projects and our properties, we have a very able-bodied leasing staff um, that reports to me and I expect them to do their job. And their job is in part to communicate with the brokerage business. Um, and we will from time to time hire a broker to lease our projects exclusively. Normally, that's in the case where there's um, something extraordinary about the project, like City Point, where I just retained Ripco to do the balance of the leasing. We did the upper floors ourselves. Ripco's going to do the balance of it. <laughs> that's not necessary. Um, um, but generally, we try to do a lot of it ourselves because it keeps us in touch with the streets and where we own. So whether that's Greenwich, Connecticut, or West, Westport, Connecticut, or if it's up in White Plains, or in Miami, Chicago, or Boston, or DC, or elsewhere. We like to do a lot of it ourselves, but we will we will use exclusive broker, broker relationships. Uh, my next question is not just a Brooklyn question, sorry, Ofer, uh, but it really relates to how retail is going to evolve in the next few years. Uh, I read I couldn't help but reading today that uh, that Google and Amazon are racing to achieve delivery of basic food, basic goods that you find in Costco and elsewhere, and the kind of things that that really uh, until now have not been sold online. And my question is, knowing that Manhattan and Fifth Avenue and certain areas of uh, Soho and perhaps Fulton Street, um, so much of the, sh of the retail uh, strength in New York is, is based on the experience and the, and the, the, uh, the advertising nature of the retail. And, but I, I was hearing when I was talking to you guys that hospitality and that element is not really that important yet in the Brooklyn retail scene. So I, I suppose what I'm interested in hearing is, how do you think the online um, world will affect the retail market in a place like Brooklyn, which is probably less, uh, which is probably less susceptible to uh, to the internet than, let's say, a box a retail store on, on on an intersection in Iowa or in Kansas would be, but it still might have some effect. So, do, do we think it could be somewhat positive, and that a lot of the internet people want to be in Brooklyn for the for the for the uh, for the PR aspect of it, or do you think it's going to be a negative, or do you think it's just it's not going to be a huge effect? Al, I think you, you have an answer. You know, if you think about Brooklyn, um, it's the most underserved. It's the fourth largest city in the country. If it wasn't a borough, most un 2.6 million people, most underserved from a retail standpoint. And I'm going to I'm going to use Peter Ripka's uh, example that he usually gives uh, pitches to my tenants is is this. Compare us to Long Island for a second, okay? Long Island. Suffolk and Nassau, 2.8 million people. We have 2.6 million people. They have, I would say, six or seven regional malls. In each mall, they would have your usual suspects, Victoria's Secret, uh, Abercrombie, Gap, and what have you. So each of you have, let's say, nine or 10 of those going out throughout Long Island. Brooklyn, two Victoria's Secrets. Two gaps, where uh, Kings Plaza and maybe a uh, Victoria's Secret Atlantic Center. So it is so from 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 a retail standpoint, it is just so much density and just so underserved that 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 you know would it have an effect? Probably, maybe a little bit, but you know, I don't think that much. Were you considering running for Brooklyn Borough President <laughs> at one point? <laughs> Go ahead, Ben. What's your answer to that? Uh, I had a better answer for the question before. Okay. So um, give, me the answer, give me the answer for the question <laughs> no, it's before. It's all right. It's all right. Um, I think I, 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 I think Albert's completely right. I think that Brooklyn is completely under util, uh, under retailed. I think that is. I think there's a lot of room on that in that runway. Um, on top of that, I think shopping online. If we're talking about serious shopping online, it, it is. Is tough to do. I think there's uh, outside of just you know a Zappos or a Amazon doing serious shopping online where you're doing Victoria's Secret or all of that stuff. I think uh, there's some real flaws to that structure. I think uh, free shipping is going to be is is a problem. I think 
people, are, I think there's going to be some real pushback eventually by retailers who see their bottom line get, uh, get really chopped into by the fact that people are buying shoes or buying pants and then sending it back. And it's on, it's on uh, J. Crew, it's on uh, Neiman Marcus, on whoever. Um, and I think that you don't have those problems at, on, with the brick and mortar. I think that's going to maintain uh, its sort of status for these tenants. Chris, I imagine there's a bigger issue for you nationally than it would be here in Brooklyn, but what do you think about all this? It is a bigger issue for us because we're beholden to uh, shareholders and fund investors who constantly quiz us on the impact of online shopping. Look, I, I, I think that online shopping as a percentage of the growth of most companies far outpaces their bricks and mortars. So to, to say that that's not going to be impactful to the retail real estate bricks and mortars that we own around the country would be naive. That said, um, I think that the retailers that we're most interested in doing business with are those that embrace a multi-channel philosophy and a multi-channel strategy whereby they're happy to make the sale irrespective of where it originates. But they don't have a business unless it's complemented by the brick and mortar strategy. So if you think about staples, you think about office supplies a little less sexy than, than apparel and otherwise, but Staples is the second largest online retailer in the world behind Amazon. Very few people know that. Staples has found a way to embrace the online experience and make it a big part of their business. Staples doesn't have a business without stores, so they're going to be around for a while. Um, to pick another extreme example, Borders Books stared into space while the whole book industry changed and moved online. Barnes & Noble's fighting the good fight. I'm rooting for them, and I believe they will survive in a smaller format. But if you don't adapt and embrace a dual platform, a dual strategy for online and bricks and mortars, you're out of business. The other really interesting thing that we're seeing, apart from Amazon and Google racing to be this provider, is companies like Piper Lime and Birchbox, and many of you may not know what they are, but Piper Lime is a, is, it was an online company owned by The Gap with one store in Soho, and now they're beginning to roll out stores. So that's an online store that is bracing, embracing a bricks and mortar experience and starting to roll out stores. Um, no. The other one is Birchbox, which was founded by two college friends uh, from Harvard, not Cornell, uh, who decided that they want to take, when you walk through a department store, they want to give you samples, so they created a business where they would provide these samples for a fee, $10 a month, they'll send you all these samples. It works so well online, they opened their first store in Soho again, and they're looking to roll out stores. So again, I think that that speaks very well to the fact that if you have a dual strategy for bricks and mortar and online, uh, online sales, it's a very, very successful and strong business model. If you're gonna pretend that the online sales are not gonna affect your business, let's think about the grocery business, which I believe is in a, in a transition period, uh, you're mistaken. It'll affect every single business. And unless you have a strategy to address that, you're dead. Thank you for a very comprehensive and well thought out response to that question. That was very good. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> uh, my, my, uh, not my last question, but a, a very important question that many people think about, uh, whether they are uh, brokers or tenants or landlords, is what is the sweet spot in terms of square footage in Brooklyn for a retailer? We, uh, as landlords and as a tenant, what do you think the best size would be, the best footprint would be for, for, for somebody not to be, you know, theoretically, you don't want to be too small, but I've heard and I've experienced that if you're too big, the price per foot that you can get is, is, is a more difficult get. And uh, at the same time, if you're too small, uh, there's not enough room to operate to do the business you need to do. So I guess if you're planning a retail project and you have, I'm going to throw out 40, 50,000 feet of retail, how do you chop that up? And I, I know this is a very important element of the retail business, uh, and I'm wondering, you know, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. How, how, do you, how do you do space allocations? Um, if I could speak for a Please. second. So, so most of the big boxes, they're, are you, they're used to paying small rents. You know, like that's like the, the TJs of the world and what have you. They used to paying thirty dollars a foot, twenty five dollars a foot. They out of town they pay ten dollars a foot. I mean, Chris could speak better than that. So, 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 so now when you come into New York, you come into Brooklyn, you say, Okay, I want two hundred dollars a foot. They're like looking at me, they, you know, but they don't understand they're gonna do so much business. They don't understand that. So what you have to look at is okay, with these guys, we have to go vertical. I'm not gonna give them the front the top foot. Top, the, the ground floor, either come to the second floor or the lower level. And you know the usual suspects, you know, TJ's needs 25,000 square feet, 
and you know they're the first to go to guys because TJ's has either Marshalls or Home Goods or what have you. Uh, uh, Burlington now is seventy thousand square feet. I think what you have to do. Burlington is, goes two levels down, right? The two, two or three levels no, they because have they, to. they can't get the, yeah. the floor <laughs> pipe big, big, big enough. I think when we look at a deal is is we have to think we think vertical and have in mind a particular type of tenant category, which is you know we know it's like in the twenty five thirty thousand dollars that thirty thousand square foot range, and then on the ground floor. You know, where you want to maximize your square footage, you know, anywhere from, let's say, the 2,500 to the 5,000 square feet. Because past that, mm -hmm. it gets to the point of diminishing returns. Yeah, you might get somebody to pay you, but they're not going to, like you said, you know, it gets diluted, and they're going to discount the rent accordingly. Right. So, so that, that's what I have to say. You see, the difference between the first floor and then vertical. Ben? Uh, I think the community is important, too. Um, certain areas have different kind of quality uh, real estate. Uh, Bedford, for example, and North Six uh, are mostly 25 by 100s. So the ability to produce, to provide a 7,000 square foot store actually in some ways gets you a higher rent because you're the only one providing it uh, when every other building is, you know, 18, you know, right. 800 to 1,800. Um, the other thing is uh, if you want credit, you know, there's not that many credit uh, tenants who can take 800 square feet. Uh, most of the bigger credit tenants who were leasing on the mall or uh, or in Bedford or Court Street, they want they want you know 3,000 up, and so you got to have you have to be able to provide that. Okay. Jeff? I think as important Chris? as as important as um, as the configuration vertically is is what you're delivering uh, to a market that's different than is already there. You know, Fulton Street and Bedford are filled with beautiful, old, wonderful buildings, but they are challenged with a very unusual column grid and very compromised ceiling heights, whether it's on the first, second, or lower levels. So, so what we think about, um, we try to put a retailer hat on and try to think about how can we provide um, efficient off-street loading? How can we provide ceiling heights that are gonna embrace a voluminous shopping experience? How are we going to design our upper floors and not compromise the lower floors with a column grid that's not logical for them to merchandise around? And then glass and signage, lastly, those two elements become critical. We try to think the way the retailer will think and try to provide that. Often becomes difficult in the urban environments. Um, and then lastly, to, the, to, to Al's point, I think that if we're starting with 50,000 feet, right away you're vertical, right? So we do want to put those big boxes in the upper floors. They're never going to pay the, the rent. And then I think you do, you're well paid for one to 8,000 square feet on the lower level. Um, if you look at uh, Fulton Street as an example, uh, Chase just made a deal across from us at $280 a foot for 7,000 square feet. That may be a new high watermark. I don't know. It's pretty close. Um, but a large box experience, and the guys that I'm talking to are the guys that you did your, your deals with, Al, are probably a lot less than that, certainly less than $100 a foot. So you got to create those opportunities for them if you want them. Jeff, what do you look for? What do you, where do you, what's your I space I mean, for us, it's, you know, it's always concept dependent on terms of what type of size you're looking for. I think, though, in general, we're always um, looking in the kind of 2,500 to 5,000 square foot range that to us, you know, is all the, on one level. Uh, yeah, generally one, all on one level, you know, you don't mind if there's a upstairs. I mean, currently all our spaces are on one level. But, um, you know, in terms of, you know, we're not in the business of opening, you know, giant restaurants. Um, the type of places that we open are fit within those footprints and also those size footprints provide the efficiencies, efficiencies that we need in terms of both the build outs and in terms of operations. Two, so. two couples walk into your restaurant celebrating somebody's 40th birthday. Yeah. How much money do they spend? What's their, what's their tab? It depends which restaurant. Your highest end restaurant, let's say. Uh, a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what, what are we looking at? Uh, you, you know, I, some I, wines, some hors d'oeuvres. What? You, you know, at, I mean, at uh, Carbone, you know, for example, um, our, you know, just put it in, you know, the basic, I mean, our average cover there is $150, which is very high. Uh, per person? Per person, yeah. Uh -huh. That's our average cover. So, 
So, you know, $600, I guess, Got dinner it. would cost Wait you. Wait for but closing dinners. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for closing dinners. Um, okay. So, so, you know, but, but always, you know, obviously, you know, it's always dependent. I mean, if you're celebrating and you're drinking a lot of wine, it could be a lot more expensive than that. So, right. um, but, you know, all of our restaurants, you can come in and, you know, the, that, that might be the average, but, I mean, all of our restaurants and, I mean, you know, Parm, for example, which are the, the ones we're bringing here in the next uh, year, um, the average dinner check there is forty dollars. So you know, it's uh, okay. you know, I think that as we evolve them, hopefully we get it a little bit. We gotta check your website to find the price that works for us. Exactly. I mean, there, there's something for everyone. Okay. I was trying to say that in a different way. Yeah. Uh, does anybody have any questions for anybody in the audience? Anybody? Please just tell us who you are and then ask your question. I can, I can talk about City Point the for question, a second. I'm sorry, the question for anybody who might not have heard was local retail, how does that figure into your projects? And we haven't heard about that yet today. So the commercial base of City Point is 550,000 square feet, and it's on five levels plus a lower level. We have been very careful to maintain a current dialogue with what we think are the great local, particularly restaurateurs and others, uh, other retailers around Brooklyn, and they have a place in that center. We think that if we make it uh, uh, otherwise, and it's filled with just chains, it just becomes another mall. We don't want to be that. It's less authentic. So the challenge is, uh, for us is building new, but then creating a tenant mix that feels more authentic than not. So we think that the perfect execution will be a mix of great national and international retailers, and then some terrific local, local players as well. So it is critical to us. Um, I, think it, it all, uh, I think it also depends on the community and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, Bedford Avenue or Fulton are very expensive streets, and there are not that many local tenants who can pay 200 or uh, 175 or 250 a foot um, to be on those streets. So we, what we did um, was we tried to do a lot of local, or and we consider a New York restaurant tour like Jeff a, a local uh, restaurant tour. We tried to put them on the side street and create uh, sort of a sort of a little mall off the major thoroughfare. So, so I, I would uh, echo exactly what uh, Ben just said, is when, when you get to the rents of the higher rents, $200 a foot, $250 a foot, there aren't that many local that, uh, operators or, um, th that could sustain that kind of rent and, 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 and do business, so, which is quite unfortunate. Somebody up there had a question. Restaurants and bars. I mean, we have to have the infrastructure uh, to, you know, to deal with this new, you know, demographic coming into, you know, 10,000 apartments. I don't know. Every every day the number changes. Uh, it's only it going gets up. higher, right? And, and gets higher. So there aren't, and the, and that's really again, to the point before the rents are getting very very high. To have restaurants and bars, and I guess maybe you look at the approaches like Bridge Street and Duffield Street and and. And, um, and, and Lawrence Street to, to, to have really cool restaurants and bars that would, that would cater to the, to the new market that's coming to, the, to this market. Anybody else have a question? Uh, in closing, I'd like to ask you all for one uh, last piece of information uh, to the audience, and that is uh, if you could name me, um, Jeff, I'm going to include you in this, even though you're not a, not a developer. I want your input also. Uh, I want you to give everybody the name of a retailer that's not currently in Brooklyn, but will be in Brooklyn by the end of, say, 2015. Give us, give us your thoughts on who's not in Brooklyn now, but you think will be in Brooklyn soon. And if you don't feel like giving up a potential lead, don't. But I think it's, it, it, we're all interested in knowing t what you guys think as to who might be coming. Go ahead, Chris. I'll start with A and I'll end with Z. How's that? Uh, Apple and Zara. Um, uh, 
Uh, I'm not sure they're here. I don't think they're here, but I think Nike will be here at some point. Okay. Al? I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, I tried to get mad at him. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know in particular, you know. Besides terms, your commissary. In terms of the big box retailers, you know, that's not as much my game. But, I mean, I think that uh, I think you're going to see a lot of people following in kind of what we're doing, which is, you know, hopefully the higher quality New York restaurateurs starting to take Brooklyn really seriously and starting to think of it as a place to open either extensions of their existing restaurants or new concepts. And I think that they're going to breed off of one another. So I think that, you know, I think this is just the beginning and we're happy to be here at the beginning, but I think it's going to be something that starts, uh, you know, proliferating all throughout, you know, kind of Brooklyn in terms of the New York's Manhattan-based restaurant tours coming over here. That question was actually a quiz and you all failed. The answer is Rocco's Tacos coming to the base of the New York Marriott Brooklyn in 2014. Anyway, that's, that's just a joke. That is, that is true, but it's, it wasn't the answer to the question. I want to, are we done? Are we, we're out of time? Okay, so I want to thank Chris, Ben, Al, and Jeff for a fantastic panel. Great job. Oh, it's here.